When I was in elementary school, I was lucky enough to have access to a computer lab that was equipped with the first generation of Apple iMac desktop computers. Did you ever work with one of these? Colorful and modern looking? They were pretty small for their size, but they were actually still bigger and weighed more than a bowling ball. Smartphones today are about a thousand times smaller, but still equally as powerful, if not more powerful, than that original iMac. But that computer that was in my elementary school 20 years ago, and the computers today that are small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, they rely on the same materials to work, which is to say their functional components are made mostly of the chemical element silicon. And silicon's cheap and abundant. It's the primary component in sand. But the other elements that silicon's blended with to make it useful for electronics, those are becoming increasingly more scarce and expensive, not to mention environmentally damaging to mine and purify. Also, the components in electrical circuits are beginning to approach the size of just a few silicon atoms. So electrical engineers are being forced to think about electronics on a completely different scale, a much smaller scale that's usually in the domain of chemists, where a different type of physics, quantum physics, is always at play. I'm Jordan Nelson, and I'm a chemist at Northwestern University. And I study how small groups of atoms in functional units called molecules could be used to create electronics that are smaller, more environmentally friendly, more energy efficient, and more capable than the electronics we use today. To address the point about environmentally friendly, the molecules I look at are made of the same atoms our bodies are made out of, which is to say they're organic molecules. And part of my research looks at how these molecules interact with light so that they can replace the materials that are used in solar panels which you probably could have guessed are made today mostly of silicon. But my specialty is actually measuring the magnetic properties of these molecules. What do magnets have to do with electronics? Well, electricity is just the flow of the smallest unit of negative charge in physics, the electron. And the electron has this intrinsic property called its spin. Like a spinning top, which can be moving either clockwise or counterclockwise, the spin of an electron can be measured in two different states. And it's the spin states of electrons that actually determine the magnetic properties of molecules or materials. So when I measure how a molecule interacts with the magnetic field, I'm actually learning quite a bit about how it could be applied to electronics. For instance, in the organic molecules that I study, and even in the molecules that plants use to generate energy from light, the spin state of the electron often plays an important role in how far that electron can move away from the molecule, so it eventually can be harvested to make energy. Also, instead of the flow of billions of electrons, the spin state of a single electron on a molecule could be used to represent the on or off of an electrical switch in a way that's much less energy intensive. Hard drives already use this technique, and it's one of the reasons why they're so energy efficient. If the spin state of the electron can represent the on or off of an electrical switch, it could also represent the zeros and ones of computer binary language. And because the electron is so small, it carries with it special properties, so-called quantum properties, which could allow for a new type of computing called quantum computing. And although many years away, a universal quantum computer could scale much faster than computers today. So they could help solve some of the biggest computational problems, like those associated with cybersecurity, machine learning, or artificial intelligence. And they could help model accurately very complex systems like the weather or the stock market. Let me leave you with what one of the pioneers of computer science, Grace Hopper, once said. The most dangerous phrase in the language is, that's the way it's always been done. And computers and electronics have revolutionized the way we live, but they'll only continue to do so if we continue to challenge the way it's always been done.